Before we get going with this week's show, a programming note and then words from our friends. In the final segment of the show, my computer went sideways. And when I got it all sorted out, started recording, uh, it did not pick up the good microphone. It's not bad audio, it's just the audio from the phone. Which, luckily enough, technology is what it is. That the It sounds halfway decent. It doesn't sound as good as this, but just fair warning, the back half, the second half of the show, if you're listening to the football stuff, the second part of it, you're going to get the iPhone's audio instead of this thing. Anyway, I digress. Uh, let's talk about some of our friends, who without them, none of this stuff is possible. Uh, let's begin with Canterbury Park. Play in the largest Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge qualifier of the year, Thursday, September the 15th. The Big Ten BCBC Handicapping Contest at Canterbury Park. Play on-site or through Express Bet and TVG. It's $2,000 live bankroll with a $1,000 entry fee. 11 Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge entries plus cash are to be awarded. 100% of entry fees are returned. Thursday, September 15th. For more information, visit CanterburyPark.com. Also, don't forget the weekend of September 17 and 18, the nation's first and longest-running live bankroll handicapping contest, now in its 26th year, the Dog Days of Summer Contest, on track only at Canterbury Park. You can win entry into the National Horse Players Championship. Also, big things going on in Franklin, Kentucky. Our friends at Kentucky Downs. Horsemen, handicappers, and racing fans won't want to miss a single day of the seven-day FanDuel meet at Kentucky Downs in early September. Owners and trainers will compete for the world's richest overnight purses, and horse players will enjoy the best betting opportunities in America with large fields and low takeout. Thanks to the Kentucky Thoroughbred Development Fund, registered Kentucky breads will run for $150,000 in maiden races with allowance races starting at $160,000. The 17 stakes totaling $10.7 million include eight graded stakes races. Kentucky Downs races September 1, 3, 5, 8, 10, 11, and 14 reserved seats are on sale at KentuckyDowns.com. There's Unique and then there's Kentucky Downs, which will be featured this weekend. On NBC, CNBC, Peacock, I'll be in studio, but we will have coverage from Kentucky Downs for an hour. We'll go over the FanDuel Turf Sprint as well as the Kentucky Turf Cup from our friends down at Kentucky Downs. Betmakers, fixed odds betting powered by Betmakers is back and in effect at Monmouth Park, and the early returns are fantastic, with 70% of winners paying more on fixed odds than they are on the tote. Fixed odds wagering is now available throughout the state of New Jersey. This is an exciting new way to bet that really puts the power to get value in your hands. The odds you bet are the odds you get. You will continue to hear a lot more about fixed odds betting opportunities across the In the Money Media Network. And last but certainly not least, our friends at Woodbine. North of the border at Woodbine brings us two stakes this weekend with the Toronto Cup for three-year-olds on Saturday, September 10th. And the Wonder Wear Stakes for three-year-old fillies on Sunday, September the 11th. For more information, go to woodbine.com. Also, don't forget about the Rico Woodbine Mile and the slew of graded stakes coming up on Saturday, September the 17th. We will have loads of coverage on the In the Money Media Network leading up to the big day. I will also be north of the border at Woodbine for TSN going over Woodbine Mile. And I'm sure there'll be a couple other races that we sprinkle in that broadcast window as well. So busy times. Thank you to everybody for helping sponsor the show. Now, on to episode 130. Pacific Classic. And there's the roar from the crowd as the field for the Pacific Classic sent on the way. They all came away to an even beginning. Extra hope on the inside. Country grammar in the white colors right there. Flightline is in the center of the track. Now he's going to be caught wide at this stage, but he might drop in later. He's getting over a little. In behind that comes Royal Ship. And on the outside, Stiletto Boy Express Train. No more than two and a half lengths separates the lot. And let's see. Flightline's going to go on with it. Now he's caught a little wide, but Flightline goes up to join Extra Hope as the pace setters. In behind that, we have Express Train. Country Grammar scrapes the paint in the white, just two lengths separates all those runners. Then comes Stiletto Boy and Royal Ship, impatiently ridden by Mike Smith, content to trail early, five off them. Down the backstretch they go, extra hope at the rail. Flight line now right up alongside and pretty keen to go on. Express Train is a joint third. Country Grammar at this stage is four and a half lengths off the favorite. Behind that comes Royal Ship and Stiletto Boy. 
A half mile to go, and Flightline doesn't want to wait. Flightline's picked up the running now, and he kicks on to lead it by a length with a half mile to go, and now he's widening. Flightline makes it two, now three as they go into the far turn. Extra Hope is next. Country Grammar down at the rail. Stiletto Boy, Express Train, and still last is Royal Ship's going to come running, but he's got a good ten lengths to make up on Flightline. Let's see, a quarter of a mile to go in the Pacific Classic. Flavion Pratt and flight line are an embarrassing lead. It must be 15 lengths as they turn for home now. And let's see, Flavion Pratt just shakes the reins at flight line and take a good look at this because you're not going to see this too often, maybe never again. Flight line, 20 lengths clear. Flavion Pratt takes a hold and canters in in the TVG Pacific Classic. Second place will go to Country Grammar. Then came Royal Ship Express Train, Extra Hope and Stiletto Boy. Had a number of instances throughout the years where you have these giant expectations and they can never really truly deliver or live up to the hype flight line did that and then some in saturday's pacific classic welcome in to the matt bernier show part of the in the money media network my name is matt bernier you can follow me on twitter at bernier underscore matt today is tuesday september the 6th 2022 it's episode 130 of this show damn near the buyer speed figure flight line earned in saturday's p classic uh, however you listen, thank you for doing so. Many ways to find the show. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and themoneypodcast.com. You can also watch and listen along over on YouTube. And if you are over there, well, first things first, anywhere you're listening, please rate, review, subscribe, thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, you name it. Over on YouTube, make sure the bell icon's lit up. That way you get notified anytime new content is uploaded to the In The Money Media channel. If you are watching, uh, it's a different look. You're not getting the full shot of me. You're getting me and the little snippet at the bottom because we're going to dive right into it. This is all we're talking about from a racing standpoint this week. It's this, and then on the back half of the show, we're going to talk NFL Week 1. So if you're not a big football fan, no problem. Dip out after this. But this performance, I, I tweeted, this, there are not enough superlatives for what you saw from Flight Line on Saturday night. There are always going to be the curmudgeons that try to say, oh, well, blah, 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 blah. If you can't recognize the the sort of uncommonness, I guess that's just a, a, a stupid way of saying unique or extraordinary or whatever. How uncommon a performance like what we saw from Flightline was on Saturday night out at Del Mar, there is genuinely nothing anyone can tell you that's going to make you think otherwise. Because if that kind of race from a horse like that doesn't doesn't give you some kind of feeling um you're you're toast you got you got no hope i mean it was such an unbelievable performance and we all knew the recipe was there the potential for something like that was there given the likely dynamics of the race and the way the horse had run and the figs he had earned and the way he had done it all you knew a giant race was there potentially but until they do it, you never know. And that's not even really bringing into idea, oh, he's got to go two turns for the first time, and he's got to go out to a mile and a quarter for the first time. We've talked about it in the past. Horses typically will run their absolute best when they're allowed to waltz on the front end, set the pace, and kick away. Think of an American Pharaoh in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Think of Pharaoh in the Belmont Stakes. Those kind of performances. Flight line, it felt like first time by the grandstand Flavian Pratt did everything he possibly could to have a target and I was at my parents house I had just gotten back from Saratoga after the Saturday show my parents live out in western mass couple hour drive I pull in I go the big horse is getting ready to run in like 10 minutes I just want to throw it on the TV and then I'll eat something and as the race is going on going on to the backside in my head, and by the way, uh, credit where credit's due, that video from the top, the entire replay of Flightline's Pacific Classic, you can find over at Del Mar's YouTube channel. They post all their stakes races. They post great content. Head on over there. Give them a like, subscribe, the whole nine. Del Mar Thoroughbred Club. They've got it all over there on YouTube. 
when they entered the backside, I said aloud to, you know, no one in particular other than my, my parents. Uh, I, I said, just, just let him, let him go. Let him go. Don't, don't even bother trying at this point. And when I was watching it on, I guess now it's FanDuel TV, uh, there were no fractions. So I'm sitting there going, well, they're, they're relatively tightly bunched, I guess. I guess it's an honest clip. I don't know. And then he starts to scoot away, and I'm going, okay, this is good. And then they start going into the far turn, and then the fractions come up. I see 46 for a half and 9 and 4 for three quarters, and I go, holy shit. And my dad goes, oh, the race is over. And I go, well, not yet, not yet. we got a long way to go. He's got to answer the questions, this, that, and the other. Country grammar starting to warm up. Royal ships trying to get involved. And then when they hit the top of the lane, it kind of dawned on me. It was very much a reminiscent feeling, and I know the stakes weren't as high, but it was very reminiscent to when I was watching, I was working for ESPN for SportsCenter, covering the Triple Crown in 2015, when Frosted popped to his left lead with, I don't know, three sixteenths to go, somewhere thereabouts. In my head, I was like, oh my God, God, he's going to win. This is it. Now I have to run back down to the set and get ready because something that many folks never thought would ever happen again is going to happen. When he changed leads at the top of the lane, flight line on Saturday, and Pratt just kind of gave him one of these, I know it was already, you know, over, but I think it really dawned on me how, what, was going on how how impressive how shocking it was for flight line to do what he did earn the fig that he did which again those of you that are listening if you want you can head over to youtube uh but i will do my best to verbalize most of you listen anyway so hopefully i do a good enough job uh flight Lion earned a 126 buyer speed figure and dare i say that is about as low as it could have been because you see Timeform US, he earned a 152. Typically take take 20 off the top. That's around a 132. Um, and in my head, you know, when you really start going through, not to go all into the whole speed figure talk about how numbers are made, this, that, and the other, but let's call it a 1.4, 1.5 points per length kind of thing at a mile and a quarter. And I know it's not perfect because different tracks have different numbers. Uh, but it, just at the, the bare bones in my head, I said, if it is, a, if it's 1.5 per length and you beat him by 19 and a quarter, a horse like country grammar, I mean, th- th- this is a minimum 125, but that's assuming country grammar didn't improve off of his San Diego, which I actually thought was light on the buyers. I thought that was probably closer to a 103 or 104. And in fact, from a buyer standpoint, you can see 126, 100, 91, 91, 85, 78. If you're kind of in my line of thinking, tack on, let's say five. And really at this point, who cares? But I mean, I I remember when Arrowgate, keep in mind, I, my first year covering, professionally covering the sport, was eight years ago, which would have been 2014, which would have been California Chrome's run through the Triple Crown. But I had been involved in the game prior, contests, you know, whether it was the Horse Players Show or even prior to that. Really first got involved, let's say, probably 09. 09 was really the first year I was all in. Like, yeah, man, this is this is it. And you see all these big performances and you see these great horses run and do these different things. And I remember when I got to the forum, talking to folks there, many different people, and just the notion of how in the 90s, there, were, there was a stretch of time where it was routine for some of these best older sort of handicap horses to earn buyers up above 120. And in my head, I was like, where the hell are those? Because I was always seeing the best of the best, ah, 106. Maybe you're maybe you sniff 110. And then when Arrowgate at the Travers earned a 120, that for me was like, holy smokes, 120. 
that's you know phenomenal and the reason I didn't bring up American Pharaohs because I believe Pharaohs classic I don't believe it was truly a 120 I'll go to my grave saying that but arrogates looked like a 120 and we know the horses that he defeated ended up being pretty good that was the first play. Wow. And then he came back and he did it again in the Classic. Then he came back again and did it down in, in Florida. And then he came back and ran that Dubai World Cup. And in my head, I'm saying, I'm never going to see a performance in my lifetime better than the one that Arrowgate put forth in Dubai. I didn't believe that. And it's not it's not taking anything away from an American Pharaoh or a California Chrome or you know any of those kind of horses. I'm specifically omitting Gunrunner because the then that same year that Arrowgate ran that race, Gunrunner took his game. It was almost like he got pissed off that he lost there out in the Middle East. And he came back and he said, no, no, now I'm boss. And he started rattling off massive races. And I said, wow, this is really a, an impressive time for, you know, I had, it had been, I say all those years. I know in the grand scheme of things, it's not a massive amount of time. But it had been five, six years and I'm going, where, you know, or not even, I guess it's probably been, yeah, in the time that I was paying attention, put it that way, five, six years ago, where are these massive figures coming from? Are, are none of the horses as good as they were 30 years ago? And, uh, you know, that's another conversation for another day. But someone also threw it out to me at one point. The notion that the thoroughbred is the only athlete that throughout the years has gotten worse than they were way back when. I mean, doesn't that seem silly? Human athletes have all gotten better throughout the years. Physically more fit, better training methods, yada, 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 technology, the whole nine. But why would the thoroughbred go backwards? But it did cross my mind because where are all these numbers coming from? So then you have that sweet spot of Chrome, who, who probably still kind of like gets lost in the shuffle, but he was a, he was a very, very good horse. Arrowgate, Gunrunner. Throw Pharaoh in there, but if, I mean, if we're just, I know maybe it's controversial. He never ran exceptionally fast. And again, I, I'm making that based on, I, I don't buy the 120 in the classic. Justified never ran enough to earn anything remotely close. So then when you get a horse like this that comes along and it seems like the sky is the limit from day one, but you never know. And then he does something like this. You can't help but be like, holy smokes, what just happened? So the 126 on the lightest side that it could possibly be, I'm going to say it's anywhere between a 125 and a 135. Put it that way. I never believed I'd see a better individual performance in my life than Arrogate's Dubai World Cup. And it's a, still debatable, given the things, the adversity that he needed to overcome. But purely on brilliance, this is the best race I've ever seen in my lifetime. I'm not, and, and Craig Milkowski tweeted it out, and he noted that, that people were sort of bent out of shape or offended by the Secretariat comparison. And he's saying, you know, I'm not, it's not an apples to apples comparison based on what Secretariat accomplished compared to what Flightline has accomplished. But purely on the, the, the Belmont run versus this Pacific Classic on Saturday, I mean, they're, they're pretty similar, are they not? It was stunning. I mean, no matter how you want to chop it up, and I'm not going to, you know, belabor the point because we've all already watched it a million times and talked about it a million different times. 23 and 2, and this is according to Formulator. 23 and 2, 22 and 3, 23 and 4, 24 and 2, 24 and 4. Going a mile and a quarter. And he beat the Dubai World Cup winner by 19 and a quarter lengths. We're not talking about a 50 claimer. This is a this is a grade one winner on the biggest stage. He just lost. By the length of the stretch almost. Like that. And by the way, he was seven clear a third. I believe Baffert was quoted saying, I think he think he won the race. I mean, it's it's hard to comprehend. I think to Frosted's Met Mile a, a number of years ago, the difference there 
and Frosted earned a gaudy number. The difference is Frosted, I don't think, really beat a hell of a lot. It was a good field, but not a great field. Say what you will if you don't believe Royal Ship on Down is the bee's knees. Country Grammar is a legitimate grade one caliber dirt router. If you took Flightline out of the equation, Country Grammar is probably, and you know what? Let me rephrase that. Even with Flightline in the equation, Country Grammar is a top five horse in the country. And he just lost by almost 20. I don't know what else there is to, if that, if it, like, the East Coast, West Coast thing that drives me nuts. I think it's such a stupid, you know, argument or for anyone that believes that kind of stuff, like, oh, East is better than West. Blah, blah, blah. Well, no, each individual circumstance presents itself in a different way. And sometimes East is better than West. And sometimes West is better than East. Sometimes South is better than North. Like it doesn't, they're all individual circumstances. The notion that anyone could find a fault in what you said, I mean, that, that is as close, I believe Jay Privman wrote it and congrats to Jay on a, Fantastic career. Wrap up this weekend out at Del Mar. And I'm I'm just kind of, you know, paraphrasing. I mean, it was a masterpiece. It was was a flawless performance. There was not one thing that you you could nitpick. It was flawless. It's both unbelievably exciting and also incredibly disappointing, though. Because maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me know beneath the video player on YouTube or on Twitter at Bernie or underscore Matt. But is and knock wood that this horse stays healthy and sound. And I'm not even talking about next year. I know John Sadler said that you know it's not not a foregone conclusion that he's done after this season. But let's just talk about November, the first weekend in November. T- tell me how this horse loses the Breeders' Cup Classic. Because what I saw Saturday, well, A, I would love to see it in person. I would love to see it in Lexington. I think it would be, you know, there are certain performances that, oh, there's my wife sneezing. Um, I, there are certain things, there's still, I'm still a, a fan of sports and greatness, more so, I would say, than a gambler. And that's not to, to I don't say that lightly. For me, it's more a matter of, I can appreciate both. Something like that, that's the kind of performance that almost, you know, if you're really romantic about things, gets you a little choked up. Because it's so above and beyond, like, comprehension in a way. But the the downside is, assuming he's healthy and nothing unforeseen, I use that phrase frequently, Unforeseen circumstances. I cannot project the horse falling out of the gate. I cannot project Flavian Pratt falling off the horse. I can't project any of that. Assuming a assuming the race is run and there's nothing crazy that happens, how does this horse lose the Breeders' Cup Classic? There's not one horse that is remotely capable of doing that. And I say that knowing what these other horses are. This is a, I, I said it, what? two, three months ago. This is shaping up to be potentially one of the best Breeders' Cup Classic fields of the past 10, 15, 20 years. And I still feel that way, especially with some of the the headway that at least one or two three-year-olds are starting to make. None of them can do what that horse just did. Look at these past performances. A 126 going a mile and a quarter. It was, oh, by the way, this is his first start since the beginning of June. Now, he'll have more time off before the Breeders' Cup. But who can who can do that? The horses that what, that I saw at, Sar- at Saratoga on Saturday, Olympiad and American Revolution, and even First Captain, but, but specifically the top two, I think they're both very, very good horses. And in any other year, would be major, particularly intriguing prices in the Classic. I think they're both mile and a quarter types. I would have liked to have seen, I said it on the show, I would, or here, I would have liked to have seen American Revolution aggressively ridden as opposed to just waiting, 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 and then trying to kick with Olympiad, but neither here nor there. I mean, look at the figs. How how are either of those horses going to warm up flight line? Career best number for Olympiad is 111. 111 compared to a 126 at a mile and a quarter. I mean, if we're just 
let's use 1.5 points as sort of the the barometer. 1.5, Like, we still have a way to go. 10 and a half, 12. I mean, you're, he's, he's, he's almost 10 lengths slower. He just won a grade one at Saratoga going a mile and a quarter. He's almost 10 lengths slower. You tell him he's going to make up 10 lengths in the next two months? Even if flight line regresses four lengths, he's still got stuff in his back pocket. If Okay, maybe it's not one of those horses. Maybe it's this one. Maybe it's Epicenter. Maybe he's got another move in him, which is possible. And by the way, he won that Travers as easy as can be. But a 112, it, it's not remotely close. I mean, like for for comparison's sake, it, it would be like if you had one of those days at Aqueduct in the winter and you've got a horse that is, you know, I'm, I'm making it up, an 85 kind of horse, an allowance horse. He's been running in graded stakes races. He can't quite cut it. He's still eligible for an N2X or whatever. I'm, I'm you know, making it up. And he's taking on horses that, you know, they're in for the tag. They've gone through the conditions, but at this point in their career, they're, you know, there's 60 buyer types. That That's the equivalent almost of what we're talking about here proportionately. Epicenter, I suppose, if you are going to try to make a case for someone else, maybe he does have another move because he is a three-year-old, he's improving, and he's in raging form. Or maybe it's this horse. Maybe it is simply life is good. Now, my argument would be, let's say you believe in your heart that a mile and a quarter is not a problem for this horse, which I don't, but let's just say you do. What race on his page right there is good enough to run with with Flightline? His career best fig came going seven furlongs. It was a 112. Flightline has four 112 or better numbers. 60% 60% of the races he has run have been faster than the career best of life is good. And none of this is, is being said. I had someone, you know, send me a, a tweet after uh, I made the comment about country grammar losing by 20, saying, oh, well, that's disrespectful to country grammar. No, it's not. It, it, it's meant to just, like, truly put into perspective what you just saw happen. You just saw an extreme talent get humbled by a unicorn. Life is good is one of the, the better horses we've had in probably five, ten years. Especially from a consistency standpoint. He's not quite, you know, at a gun runner or an arrowgate level, but he's unbelievably good. His career best number. Flightline has equaled it or bettered it in four of his five lifetime starts. The only time he didn't was his career debut. But you get a 105 and he was geared down when he won by 13, going six furlongs. I mean, it's it like it's it's hard to Wrap your mind around what happened on Saturday. Truly, to me, it is anyway. And tell me if I'm going overboard. But what? how does this horse lose at Keeneland in November? Assuming nothing bizarre happens. I mean, he's going to be... What's he going to be? I mean, shit, you could... If he's... If for whatever reason, he's three to five in the race, you could say that's actually value. He's lengths faster than everyone else. Which is bananas, because I think this, I maintain, this is as good a Breeders' Cup Classic as we've seen in probably 10 years. And there's one horse right now that if he shows up, I think everybody else is running for second. It's incredible. Let me know your thoughts about the horse, the race, the whole nine. Beneath the video player on YouTube or on Twitter, at Bernie or underscore Matt. Uh, Just fascinating. All mark, all credit to John Sadler and everybody involved with this horse. Clearly, he had been an ouchy type throughout his career, but for him to do what he's done. And early on, I was of the opinion, prove to me that you're that good. And he has done it each and every time at different distances, at different tracks, with different trips. He's just brilliant. I think he, I think he's the best horse I've ever seen in my lifetime. If they all ran their best, I think his best is better than everybody else's best which is wild. Let me know what you think about Flightline and everything else about the Pacific Classic and the Breeders' Cup. Um, 
Now, let's shift our attention to week one, Thursday night. We've got real, real football that counts. It's the Bills and the Rams. NFL is back, baby. Week one, projections, some players to keep an eye on, the whole nine. We'll do this each week for the rest of the NFL season. Week one of the NFL season, those of you that are new to the show, uh, last year and for years prior, I've gone through and done different iterations of selections, a little, uh, you know, three pick trifecta kind of thing. Last year, I went through and did percentage probabilities uh, and played along over on 538.com. That's not up and running just yet. I don't know if they're going to do it or not this year. Um, So for the time being, I'm just going to go through the entire slate of games starting on Thursday night with the season opener with the Bills at the Rams, uh, give you a projection based on my model, which early in the season is difficult because you're using a lot of data from the season prior. Then you're slowly incorporating new data when it comes along. So there may be some some growing pains. and Maybe we're perhaps using things that aren't going to be necessarily the most predictive early on in the year because we're dealing with different players, different teams, things like that. But I've updated the rosters and I'll have to go ahead and make mine for this upcoming season and kind of combine them as more and more time goes by and we've got more data points to use. But for the time being, I'll give you a projection based on my model of a final score, uh, perhaps a play if I think something kind of sticks out. And then also um, with my model and, you know, I guess the Super Bowl was kind of the the crowning achievement of it last year. For those of you that didn't listen to that show, you can go and find the early February pod you know, in the podcast feed or over on YouTube, um, it was really, really accurate for the big game. Um, Had projected the Rams winning 23 to 19, had many of the player projections, you know, plus or minus a handful of little pieces here and there. So I was very pleased with the way it all played out last year. Hopefully it's just as good, if not better this year, but I'll also throw out a couple of names um, and some stat lines, some notable ones that my model thinks could possibly come to fruition. If you're someone who plays props or you're playing DFS or just your own home fantasy league, you've got some of these guys just do with it what you will. And if you're not a football fan, you can kill the pod right now and I'll be back next week. Uh, Thursday, the opener of the bills at the Rams, the bills are two point favorites according to uh, draft Kings. And this is as of Tuesday afternoon. So the numbers could move a little bit here and there Uh, what you get or whatever book you use. That's entirely up to you. Uh, Bills minus two at the Rams. I have a projected final score of 23 to 19 in favor of Buffalo. I have Buffalo winning 63.7% of the time. Uh, Josh Allen, 26 for 41, 221 touchdown, one pick. Also seven carries for 38 yards. Cooper Cup, 10 targets, seven catches, 91 yards and a touchdown. Uh, If I were going to make a play on the game, it'd probably be the under. Uh, It's currently listed at 51 and a half. As you can see, my projection has it coming well under. Um, you know, I guess that's dangerous with two teams that have such potent offenses that at least, especially from what we saw last year, and I know Stafford's a little bit dinged up with his elbow, but you would assume even with the departure of Brian Dayball from Buffalo, that there's still going to be a uh, sort of high flying offense early in the season. Maybe there's a little bit of ring rust. Um, I, if I were going to make a play on the game, I don't think I'm going to, uh, but I'd go under 51 and a half again, projected. 23 to 19 in favor of Buffalo. Sunday, the Rams at the Jets. Uh, Rams, the Ravens at the Jets. Ravens are seven point favorites. Uh, I have Baltimore winning 28 to 20. They win 70.1% of the time. The most notable stat line from that game from my numbers Lamar Jackson, 22 for 32, 269, a touchdown and a pick. Also runs for 79 yards on 13 carries. Uh, there wouldn't be a, a real play in there for me. I just don't think there's enough of uh, value. But again, you can go through and look at the prop market. Perhaps you can get something on Lamar uh, with a uh, rushing total or something like that. Uh, the Patriots at the Dolphins. The Dolphins are three and a half point home favorites. My projections have the Patriots winning outright 24 to 20. Uh, I have them winning 63.2% of the time. Damian Harris, 13 carries, 62 yards and a touchdown. Ramondre Stevenson, 11 carries for 51. Uh, Hunter Henry, Four targets, three catches, 32 yards, and a touchdown. If I were going to make a play on that game, um, I I feel like anytime you have a proper edge, you should be taking it. And maybe the, you know, air quote, safer play is to take the points, plus three and a half, anytime that you can get outside that field goal zone. You know, that's certainly something that you have to consider. But at plus 155, I would be more interested in taking the Patriots on the money line. And you would think, you know, you've got to go through and track your results, no different than horses. Uh, and identify where there are strengths and weaknesses. But over the long run, if the model's any good, 
I would, would like to think taking plus 155 shots that you're going to win far more frequently than whatever the implied probability there would be, which is going to be somewhere in that sort of, what, high 30% range, whatever it may be. Um, I, I think that's a, a positive kind of expectation. So I would be taking the Patriots on the money line plus 155. And that's not just a homer play. That's what the numbers say. I'm still dubious about Tua overall. I think Tyreek Hill, I think it sounds better than it actually will be in actuality. Um, I do think their running back situation is interesting. Uh, especially if, if Raheem Mostert can stay healthy, which I know is kind of stupid because he's never been able to stay healthy. Um, I think Chase Edmonds is good. I think he's going to thrive down there, uh, but I don't know that that's enough to put them over the top. Jalen Waddle was really good last year. I think he'll be just as good. You know, maybe he doesn't improve because it's hard to improve off the kind of season that he had. But uh, and as far as the Patriots are concerned, you know, in the preseason the offense looked like crap. But I don't know. I, 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 until if there's any kind of improvement from Mac. Combined with what they've got, you know, for the most part, offensively, they're kind of in the same boat. You pick up Devontae Parker. I don't know if that's really going to make a a tremendous difference, but um, I think the two teams were rather comparable last year. So uh, give me the Patriots, 24 to 20, plus 155 on the money line. Colts at Texans. The Colts are seven-point favorites. I have Indianapolis winning 26 to 19. They win 69.7% of the time. Uh, Jonathan Taylor, 23 for 142 and a touchdown. Michael Pittman. Eight targets, six catches, 79 yards, and a touchdown. Those are the only real notable ones in a game that I'm not particularly intrigued by. Uh, Pittsburgh at Cincinnati. The Bengals are six-and-a-half-point favorites. Uh, I have Cincinnati winning 20-16, to 16, so they don't cover the number. They win 61.1% of the time. Joey B, 21 for 31, 285, two touchdowns and a pick. Joe Mixon, 20 for 98, and a touchdown on the ground. T. Higgins, 11 targets, seven catches, 77 yards, and a touchdown. And Jamar Chase, Seven targets, four catches, 85 yards, and a touchdown. I would be playing under in this spot, under 44. I've got to come in at 36. So that's probably one of the games or one of the plays that I'm going to be making, point blank. Um, I just, those NFC North games, I know Cincinnati had a couple last year where they just, you know, got in track meets going up and down the field. Um, I don't, but they're typically that division is just they when they get into battles with one another they turn into just kind of slogs and uh say what you will but as good as as feel good a story as it was for Cincinnati last year now there's a bit of an expectation for you to put up and it's a different position to be in I know Burrow has won everywhere and won everything that there is to win basically throughout his career but uh going back to, to college but I just this would be one, you know, not that I have a ton of faith in Mitch Trubisky, but I think it'll be a tighter game than, than maybe what some some might think. 20-16, to 16, I think the Bengals do win. I don't think they're going to cover. I would go under 44 points. Uh, San Francisco at Chicago, the 49ers are favored by 7. I don't love San Francisco in general, but as everyone has brought up, the Bears are a bit of a hot mess, and my model has this being a bit of a dump trucking. 27-14, uh, to 14, San Francisco, then winning 82.9% of the time outright. Uh, Trey Lance, 17 for 24, 296, three touchdowns and a pick. Justin Fields, 13 for 21, 221, a touchdown and a pick. Elijah Mitchell, assuming he's healthy, he's questionable. He's got a little bit of a hamstring thing. It sounds like he's back to doing some work. Uh, I, you know, again, we still have a few days between now and, and Sunday, so hopefully he continues to practice and he's going to be, you know, getting fully integrated. Uh, assuming he does play, uh, I have him going for 21 carries and 103 yards which would be uh, quite a nice seasonal debut. Uh, Debo Samuel, uh, six targets, four catches, 95 yards and a touchdown. George Kittle, five for four, 70 yards and a touchdown. Uh, I would be more interested from a gambling standpoint rather than lay the seven with San Francisco. Maybe you get greedy. You, You take an alternate number. You take minus 10 at plus 140. Uh, which for me, I would still have a bit of a cushion. I've got a 13-point differential. You know, again, maybe that's being greedy. Uh, San Francisco has sounded like they've had their own little issues in camp, especially with the whole Garoppolo thing and and all those issues and the drama behind the quarterbacks and yada, yada, yada. But um, when push comes to shove, it just feels like Chicago just doesn't have the horses to run. Uh, and San Francisco has legitimate talent on their squad. So uh, give me the Niners. I would probably push that out to minus 10 at plus 140, some sort of an alternate line like that. But I do think you have a number of guys in that game 
that if you're playing DFS or you're looking to make some sort of a prop bet, maybe you can take advantage of a couple of numbers there and try to bump them up. I'm fearful. This may be the game that I use from a survivor standpoint, um, but I... So often the ones that look obvious, are they don't play out that way. I feel like the most obvious one early on this season in week one is Baltimore at New York. But this one's probably not far behind, San Francisco at Chicago. Um, be curious to see. I haven't locked that in yet. I got some time. But that's probably a lean right now for a survivor pool. Philadelphia at Detroit. The Eagles are favored by four. I've got Philly winning 28-20, to 78.9% of the time. Jalen Hurts... I don't think he's a good quarterback, but you can separate the two. You can separate a good NFL quarterback from a good fantasy quarterback. Um, although, to be fair, these would be very good numbers for any quarterback. 17 for 27, 266, two touchdowns and a pick, and then on the ground, 11 for 64 and a touchdown. Uh, DeAndre Swift, 12 for 48, and then six targets, five catches, 29 yards. A.J. Brown in his debut for the Eagles, seven targets, four catches, 68 yards, and a touchdown. I, I don't, I'm not buying into the, the major hype for the Eagles. I think that division sucks in general, and I don't think they're that much better than everyone else. I know they've got, you know, some some interesting acquisitions in the offseason. Um, they just picked the, the, the kid from New Orleans, the, the cornerback. I, there, there have been too many instances where everybody goes, oh, that's the team, that's the team, that's the team. They weren't that good last year. Did they get that much better this year in the offseason? Maybe they did. They did all, you know, readily admit I was wrong. But I just, any team that takes or gets the kind of hype that they do that didn't really do anything the year before. You know, Buffalo, I get it. Buffalo's proven themselves that they are they are genuinely elite. Philadelphia, people are talking about them like they're, you know, a top 6-7 kind of Super Bowl probability team. It seems a little unlikely to me. Uh, one game that I will just flat out say <laughs> I've highlighted in my little uh, my little mini iPad here uh, which by the way anybody that uses like tablets and stuff get the mini it's fantastic I used to carry around the big iPad doing any of the shows for you know out at the track or whatever and it's just it, it sounds silly but it's a, it's a large piece to carry around and you got to hand it off to somebody and X Y and Z this little guy I mean you don't have all the bells and whistles only 60 per refresh rate compared to um, the 120 with the promotion with the other the iPad Pro but this thing is very nice and it's like 400 bucks not that 400 dollars is not you know it's not nothing but big picture something that's this small that you know anyway I digress um, the Saints and the Falcons the Falcons team is a, is a whole because I didn't have much data on Mariota last year and it's been a minute since he's actually had meaningful time in games. It's kind of hard for me to have statistics to use to base projections off of against what a team like New Orleans would do defensively. Um, add to that some of the, the younger guys coming in. I, I didn't feel comfortable or confident actually throwing something out there. So I have written in abstain. We are not uh, going over this game. Browns at Panthers. The Panthers are two and a half point favorites. Uh, I have them winning 19 to 18. They win 51.2% of the time. Baker Mayfield, 18 for 29, 211, two touchdowns and a pick. Uh, his new teammate, Christian McCaffrey, 13 for 62 on the ground, and then three targets, three catches, 52 yards through the air. DJ Moore, six targets, three catches, 72 yards, and a touchdown. And for the Cleveland Browns, Nick Chubb, 17 for 91. Kareem Hunt, 10 for 49 and a touchdown, along with a couple of catches for 19 yards, a game that I don't have much interest in. Uh, uh, same can be said about the Jacksonville Jaguars at the Washington Commanders. I'm still calling them the football team. Uh, Washington is two and a half point home favorites. I have them winning 18 to 17, uh, winning 52% of the time. And there are no notable performances from my projections, so pff, screw it, we're out. Uh, Giants at Titans. This is an interesting one. Tennessee is a five and a half point home favorite. I have them winning 19 to 17, winning 57.7% of the time. Derrick Henry, assuming he is fully back, and that's the thing that's difficult to sort of factor into a projection. I'm assuming he is back to full health, uh, but a big guy on a bad foot, not necessarily a recipe for success. Assuming he's good and he gets that typical Derrick Henry workload, 
Uh, 32 carries for 144 yards and a touchdown. Sounds like a lot, but, I mean, we saw what happened for those first, what, eight, nine weeks of the season last year. Um, he was carrying the ball far too frequently, for being honest. But uh, assuming he's healthy, I think you're going to see those same kind of numbers. Uh, Saquon Barkley, 10 for 40 on the ground, adds another three catches for 19 yards. Uh, I would be interested in playing the under there. You could also consider taking the Giants plus five and a half. I don't think they're going to be terrible. I know a lot of people think they're going to be garbage. And I, I don't, I think that division sucks in general. So that's one thing. But I just, I don't, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that the Giants are going to be the dregs of the NFC. I just don't. I, I, there are too many other teams that are crummy. For them to just be slam dunk, no doubt about it, they're going to be the worst of the worst. Um, you could make a case for them at plus five and a half. I'd be more interested in taking the under 43 and a half. Uh, Las Vegas Chargers, excuse me, <laughs> Las Vegas Raiders at Los Angeles Chargers. Chargers are three and a half point home favorites. I have Vegas winning outright 24 to 22, winning 56.4% of the time. Justin Herbert, 25 for 41, 224 and two touchdowns. Austin Eckler with a big game, 13 for 58 and a touchdown, and then adding in eight targets, six catches, 31 yards and another touchdown. So perhaps from a DFS standpoint, I know he cost, I think he's in that sort of $8,000, $8,200 range over on DraftKings. Uh, he would be one to certainly consider. Uh, Mike Williams, nine targets, five catches, 54 yards and a touchdown. Uh, but the the performance that I'm sure most people would be interested in is Devontae, uh, Devontae Smith, Devontae Adams making his uh, Raiders debut. Nine targets, seven catches, 73 yards and a touchdown. I would be looking at, and I'm tempted to make the play on the Raiders money line, plus 150 in Josh McDaniel's debut as their head coach. Kansas City Chiefs at the Arizona Cardinals, the Chiefs six point favorites. I have Kansas City winning 26 to 18, winning 71% of the time. Pat Mahomes, uh, 25 for 37, 230, two touchdowns and a pick. Uh, Kyler Murray, 25 for 36, 262. Two touchdowns and an interception, adding in six carries for 30 yards. James Conner, now you don't have to deal with Chase Edmonds anymore. Um, Conner was the guy who vultured all the touchdowns anyway, so things shouldn't change there. 12 carries, 49 yards, and a touchdown. And for the Chiefs, Travis Kelsey, nine targets, six catches, 64 yards, and a touchdown. Green Bay Packers at the Minnesota Vikings. The Packers are one-and-a-half-point favorites on the road. Have them winning 26-18. to 18. 73.2% of the time. Aaron Rodgers, 24 for 36, 259, three touchdowns, no interceptions. Kirk Cousins, 23 for 36, 223, two touchdowns and a pick. Uh, the big story for me from a, a projection standpoint were the Green Bay running backs, both of them. A.J. Dillon, 12 carries for 53 yards, four targets, three catches, 30 yards. And then Aaron Jones, 12 carries for 60 yards, seven targets, six catches, 42 yards, and a touchdown. Dalvin Cook, 16 for 75. Uh, Justin Jefferson, five targets, three catches, 81 yards and a touchdown. Adam Thielen, five targets, three catches, 47 yards and a touchdown. I would be more interested, if you like Green Bay, minus one and a half. Don't get cute. I think it's minus 110. Lay the, lay the minus 120 and just take Green Bay on the money line. Don't do anything silly like that. Um, I like Minnesota. I think Minnesota's going to be good. I think they're Clearly the two best in the NFC North. I know a lot of people seem to like the Lions and think that they could be, you know, taking a big step forward here this year. You know, I, I've seen the Lions too many times. Like, give me give me six weeks of a sample before I go making any crazy uh, assessments like that about a team like the Detroit Lions, given their history. The Sunday night game, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at the Dallas Cowboys. The Bucs are two-and-a-half-point road favorites. I have them winning 24-19. to 19. 61.4% of the time. Tom Brady, 27 for 44, 238, two touchdowns and a pick. Dak Prescott, 30 for 43, 216, two touchdowns and a pick. It seems like an awfully small amount of yards compared to 30 completions, but, you know, again, numbers are numbers, projections are projections, could be spot on, could be way off. Uh, Mike Evans, eight targets, five catches, 50 yards and a touchdown. CeeDee Lamb, 11 targets. Seven catches, 58 yards, and a touchdown. And then we'll wrap up with the Monday night game. Uh, Russell Wilson, the Denver Broncos, go to Seattle, take on his old team in the Seahawks. Uh, the Broncos are six-and-a-half-point road favorites. I've been winning 24-16, to 16, winning the game 71.1% of the time outright. All those percentages, 
and probability standpoint are outright, not how often they'll cover the spread. Uh, I have Russ going 22 for 32, 256 and two touchdowns. Uh, Geno Smith, 15 for 23, 233 and two touchdowns. Melvin Gordon, 15 for 59 and a touchdown on the ground. Javante Williams, 14 for 54, four targets, three catches, 24 yards through the air. Selfishly, I hope that goes up because I have a lot of stock in Javante Williams in my two fantasy football leagues. Uh, Jerry Judy, eight targets, five catches, 60 yards. Cortland Sutton, eight targets, five catches, 59 yards. DK Metcalf, now without Russell Wilson, four targets, two catches, 52 yards, and a touchdown. So there you have it. These are the opening week projections some players to keep an eye on. And we'll come back next week and discuss, for better or for worse, how those all worked out. And then we'll do it again next week for week two. This will be a recurring thing. So at the end of these shows, if you're not a National Football League fan, you don't like betting on football, you don't like fantasy football, any of that kind of stuff, totally fair. I'm not going to hold it against you if you check out early. Uh, but if you're curious about some things that I like, some things that the computer's spitting out, uh, stick around. Because that's how we're going to wrap up these shows for the rest of the well, I mean, I say for the rest of the year, it's going to go right through into 2023. So, um, but that's going to do it for this week's show. Leave your thoughts about any of the games, about what we saw this past weekend, just the off the charts performance from Flightline and the ramifications for the Breeders' Cup as a whole. Beneath the video player on YouTube or on Twitter at Bernie or underscore Matt. Uh, however you listen, thank you for doing so. Please rate, review, subscribe. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, in the moneypodcast.com. You can watch and listen along over on YouTube as well. Search bar map or any your show. You will get this episode along with the 129 prior. Uh, I will be back on Monday, again, Saturday, NBC. We're going to be covering, I say it's NBC. It's it's a combination of NBC, CNBC, and Peacock. One of those three, or two of those three. Uh, we will be covering racing from Kentucky Downs. I'll be in Connecticut, but uh, Ed Zo and Nick Luck will be down in Franklin, Kentucky. I was down there last year. It's a really cool track. Looking forward to covering Kentucky Downs Racing. Breeders' Cup Challenge Series winning your in stuff this weekend. I will be in studio in Stanford. But until Monday, when I'm back with another episode of this pod. Best of luck, however you play, whatever you play, wherever you play. This has been episode 130 of the Matt Burner Show. <laughs>